Hi, my name is Shauna, and today I'm going to recreate Margot Tenenbaum's signature outfit out of cookies. This is the first in what's going to be a series where I recreate iconic outfits from movies and TV, all while sharing my thoughts on the movie or show, the characters, and the outfits themselves. I'm no film critic, nor costume or fashion critic, so this is just my personal musings. do do do, do. Cookie smile. Real quick sidebar, I do have some issues with the camera focusing during this video. Uh, this is my first video with a new camera, so I'm sorry about that. The sections don't last too, too long. So sorry. So Margot Tenenbaum, played by Gwyneth Paltrow from 2001's The Royal Tenenbaums, is the adopted daughter of the titular Royal Tenenbaum. She is a former child prodigy playwright. She keeps her personal life so secret, even her family knows nothing about her. And she is, in my opinion, essentially the human embodiment of ennui. Okay, cookie time. First, I cut out all of the pieces of Margot's outfit from the cookie dough. I'm using my projector to project the sketches that I did onto the surface of the cookie dough, and then I use my X-Acto knife with my number 10 blade to cut the pieces out. Margot's outfit consists of a long tan fur coat, a striped tennis dress, loafers, and a red barrette. I will also be making some cookies of her accessories, like her Birkin bag. She has a prosthetic right ring finger, and so her baby pink gloves have been altered to accommodate that. And Margot has also been a secret smoker since the age of 12, so I'll be making the Q-tip box, that's one of her hiding places, and a tiny little cigarette cookie. This whole time that I've been cutting out the shapes, I have not moved any of the cookies, I have not even removed any of the excess dough. And that's because I'm going to take the entire sheet and pop it into the freezer till everything is super firm and that way when I go to remove the excess dough I'm not going to accidentally nudge the actual cookie shapes and warp them into the wrong shape because they're so frozen that they're going to retain their shape. So I eventually decide to bake all of these smaller pieces separately so that's everything except for the coat, the dress, and the purse and that's just because they're so small that they would burn before the big pieces finish baking. In fact, the Brett finger and cigarette cookie are in a three-way tie for the smallest cookies I have ever, ever made. They are so cute. And here are the cookies after baking. As you can see, I accidentally left the bigger ones in for a little bit too long, so it's extra good that I removed those smaller pieces. Otherwise, they would be truly burnt. And it's time to decorate. Let's start with the coat. For the coat, I use a technique that I've seen my friend Koi Biscuit use. She does these really lovely cookies that are like nudes of ladies with an emphasis on showing realistic women's bodies well, with all their curves and folds, etc. Her work is absolutely gorgeous. Definitely go follow her. I'm linking everything down below. Go do it now. Um, to accomplish uh, these realistic women's bodies, as she outlines the cookie, she'll include lines to represent like the round of a butt cheek or some cleavage, uh, and then she'll let that dry a bit. Then as she floods, she'll flood up to those lines, being careful not to go over them. It'll leave sort of a divot where that initial line was, and voila, a thigh crease. I'm using that same technique here to show the draping of the fabric of the coat. I wanted the icing itself to have some dimension and not to rely on the painting step which comes next for all of that dimension and shadow. Now people much smarter than me have pointed out that Margot, or really any character, wearing the same thing in adulthood that they did as a child shows that that character is in arrested development, that they're stuck in a past self. For most people, wearing exactly what you wore at age 13, at age 30, whatever, would leave you looking woefully age inappropriate. But for Margot, because her signature outfit has both more mature and more youthful pieces in it, she never looks completely out of place at either age, but also not 100% in place at either age. She's got one foot in the child bucket and one foot in the adult bucket, and I think this reflects her emotional state too. When she's a teenager, this long fur coat and her higher end accessories show that she's precocious, a prodigy, a mind beyond her years. And it's the tennis dress and barrette that are what grounds her as a child. But when she's an adult, it's the barrette that seems like this whimsical nod to childhood, and it's the fur coat that kind of ages her up. One of the things I actually don't have pictured here is Margot's heavy eyeliner, because it's not a piece of clothing and I wouldn't know how to make a cookie out of that. But that heavy eyeliner is pure young adult angst, and I think that's actually her truest self. She popped out of the womb a completely dissatisfied 19-year-old and has not changed since.
And now on to the tennis dress, which I would call a polo dress, but you know, again, not a professional. Okay, so other people who have done costume analysis on Margot's outfit will say that she's kind of a walking contradiction. She wears this preppy dress, but with emo eyeliner. She wears the clothing of the country club set, but doesn't live by their norms. People will point to her heavy makeup and her promiscuity as her way of rebelling against this high society, but I feel like her real sin is just not participating in that society. You know, she's shown as a kid at some cocktail parties, standing silent with her arms crossed, wanting nothing to do with any of the schmoozing. And as an adult, she really doesn't want to have anything to do with anyone. And while I love the spirit of donning the clothes of the group while actively rejecting their values as this like huge middle finger, it's still defining yourself in relation to that group. And this is exactly Margot's relationship with her father. You know, as a kid, she's always trying to win his approval, but he's always pointing out that she's adopted and just shits all over her playwriting. And a lot of her rebellious activity stems from trying to spite her father. But the thing is, if you live your life in spite of someone, that's still them exerting influence over you. Real rebellion would be to let go of any feelings toward them at all. And now we are getting really close to describing me from ages 12 to now. <laughs> also, strong Lorelai Gilmore energy. What's up? The painting for this cookie took forever and ever. Those stripes were so tiny. But yeah, uh, the tiny little stripes on this freaking polo dress <laughs> took me, I think, probably an hour altogether but it's okay i still have tons of back episodes of the podcast you're wrong about so you know a good time was had by all i am so so happy with how the painting of this dress turned out especially as i add the shading towards the end and you know my line thickness is not super even but i think that actually totally works for something within the wes anderson universe i feel like a lot of his aesthetic has this sort of homemade aspect to it. In fact, I had the DVD of Royal Tenenbaums as a teenager, and there was this booklet inside, and it had sketches of the Tenenbaum house, including detailed drawings of the decor in the kids' rooms, and it was all this very loose, hand-drawn feeling, and I feel like this cookie totally matches. So honestly, when I first watched the Royal Tenenbaums back in the early 2000s when I was a teenager, I didn't know what a Birkin bag was. I actually didn't really pay much attention to what kind of bag Margot was holding. And even on the rewatch I did for this video, when I was already acutely aware from my pre-research that she has a Birkin bag, I still didn't really notice it while watching the movie. And this kind of makes sense because I've never had strong feelings for this bag. So I actually looked up the rise of the Birkin bag throughout time, and it didn't begin its climb until 2001, the year the Royal Tenenbaums came out. So, A, it makes sense that me as a suburban 12-year-old didn't clock it for what it was, but also means that the significance of the Birkin bag and why it was chosen by the costume designer in 2001 is so different from what the Birkin bag means today. Certainly, it's always been an Hermes bag, so it's always been a luxury good. But now, not only is it the ultimate status symbol for the wealthy and fashionable, but it's mainstream. Celebrities known for having them are Victoria Beckham, Jennifer Lopez, the Kardashians. If the Kardashians have them, then everybody knows about it. If the Royal Tenenbaums were made today, I don't know if the costume designer would give Margot a Birkin bag. I don't think Margot would covet it. It certainly would fall into the category of wearing the high status thing as an FU, but it takes effort to acquire one of these bags and I can't see her going through all that. Now the costume designer Karen Patch has said that the bag could have been vintage from her mom, but I do think that a costume designer today might shy away from it because of its association with celebrities like the Kardashians. Now overall, Margot's whole look kind of does give you this feeling of Margot Tenenbaum somehow found the world's best thrift store and possibly thrifted all of these things. I, I do feel like it is a toss up either way, whether or not the Birkin bag would still make sense now. 
Either way, even though I don't super love the Birkin bag, I loved making this cookie. Uh, it was super fun to work on these tiny little details. I think my new favorite cookie to make might be purse cookies. So if you have another famous bag you'd like to see me make, do let me know in the comments below. Margot's barrette strikes me as the piece most signifying her holding on to childhood. The thing that Margot longs for from her childhood that the movie spends more time on is of course her closeness with Richie, but the one that I relate to more is her childhood success as a playwright. Now I'm not saying that I was also a successful childhood playwright, um, but I did have this romantic idea of like prodigyhood. When I first watched this movie, I was about young Margot's age. In fact, I'm the same age as the actress that plays young Margot. And I used to be really obsessed with the idea of achieving success really early in life. And I wanted all of that accompanying recognition. Uh, if I could just make the 30 under 30. Uh, I don't know if that obsession came from this movie. I don't think so. I think it was pre-existing. But this certainly reinforced that. I know that all of that is saying a lot about myself right now. But it's okay. I'm an open book. That's fine. Also, fun fact, I had the wrong definition for the word barrette in my head until this year. Um, I thought a barrette was another word for hair tie, but now I know it's a clip. So I think we mostly didn't use the word barrette in my house when I was a kid, and then they kind of fell out of fashion for a while, so there was no need to learn it. You know, English isn't my mom's first language, and my dad, bless his heart, in single dad mode, he would sometimes braid my hair, and I think he called the ties barrettes, so I think that's how it happened. Anyways, look at how tiny this cookie is. It's so cute, it kills me. At age 14, Margot runs away from home to find her birth family. While there, she helps out chopping wood by holding the log and boop, her birth father chops her finger right off. When Ari and Uzi ask her if she tried to sew it back on, she just says, it wasn't worth it. It's gotta be pretty heartbreaking to run away from your home because your adoptive father makes you feel like you don't belong, only to meet your birth father and have him maim you. But she probably knew the instant she arrived in Indiana that she didn't belong there. She had her signature Margot look plus jet black dyed hair compared to the like almost Amish looking litter of kids over at her birth family's house. Her finger getting chopped off just sealed the deal that she didn't belong there. And her attitude towards losing it sealed her resignation that she does belong back in New York with the Tenenbaums. Her brushing off losing her finger is the defining moment of Margot's public persona that she cannot be phased. But often it's the people who seem the toughest that are actually the most vulnerable. They build up their shields because any direct blow would be too much to bear. As a teenager, I admired her coldness and saw it as strength. But rewatching it now, the Margot moment that hits me so much more is when she actually is vulnerable with Richie in the tent after he attempts suicide. I'll link the scene down below so you can watch just that scene. He shows her his wounds, and even though she's lived through a really gruesome injury, she can't look at his arms. She allows a reaction for him, this protective and scared reaction, that she won't even allow for herself. As an adult, seeing her finally let herself love and show a warmth generated such a stronger reaction for me than the tough coldness that I liked as a kid. Um, and then right before she leaves the like womb-like protection of the tent, she cries. It's the only time I think we see her cry in the movie and kisses his hand. And then she promptly exits the tent and says, that's it. That's all the time that they get to be like that together. And you know, the downside to building such a rigid structure around your emotions is that you also limit the happiness that you can have. Um, okay, so we got a little uh, deep there, but now we're gonna talk about cigarettes. <laughs> So I actually would probably not wear any of the clothes that Margot has. They're just too preppy for me. But the one thing I did do is start smoking as a teenager and hide it from my parents for a decent chunk of time. Real quick, if you don't smoke, don't start. 
is not good. But as a kid, I definitely fell into the camp of, I hear you, it's not healthy, but it sure does look cool. <laughs> uh, and Margot Tenenbaum definitely sticks out as one of the cooler smokers. And I know I'm not the only one who thinks that because my friend told me while I've been working on this project that she used to make our other friend give her her cigarette to light so she could light both cigarettes at once the way Margot does on the roof with Richie. I actually remembered also while editing this that I drew a little secret smokers arsenal sketch in my notebook of all the things that I used to help hide my smoking. <laughs> and I just dug it up from out of my closet and holy smokes if it's not the most Wes Anderson thing I have ever done in my entire life. Okay, so I don't actually have very much to say about these loafers. So instead, I want to chat a bit about Margot Tenenbaum's lasting place in our collective hearts as like a girl's cool girl. The modern cool girl trope usually refers to a woman who drinks cheap beer and plays video games with the guys and guys can talk about women in front of her. A girl's cool girl is effortlessly fashionable, urges you to go on adventures that you wouldn't go on otherwise, knowledgeable about art, worldly, strong, but still feminine. Though written by a man, Margot Tenenbaum is that girl's cool girl, kind of twee, woman anti-hero that the world needed, and 20 years later, she's still iconic. And that is all the cookie pieces done for Margot Tenenbaum's outfit made out of cookies. This was a super fun project for me to do. Um, I had so many more thoughts about Margot Tenenbaum than I thought I would. Rewatching movies and then crafting about them is a really great way to just have a bunch of time to engage with the material and really think about the characters and the themes. Luckily, The Royal Tenenbaums is truly a really good movie. The story is so tidy in how it's told. Um, just like everything is just tied up nice and neat with a little bow. So yeah, uh, if you enjoyed this video, if you enjoyed this idea of watching me make cookies out of outfits from popular characters from movie and TV, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. Like I said, I want to do more of these. And if you have any ideas or requests or suggestions about what other characters or movies to do next, please drop a comment below. Um, yeah, and until next time, thank you so much. Hey friends, thanks for watching. Do all the things and see you next time.